Welcome to Wordle Elixir Flavor. My name's Theo. Um, I'm going to be walking you through how I built Wordle with the tech stack that we consult with at Alembic. Um, so first and foremost, a little bit of background so that you can kind of get the full context here. Um, Alembic is a web consultancy, so we're based out of Australia, primarily in Sydney, but we have uh, members all across Australia, a couple of employees in the US and a couple of employees in New Zealand. Um, and we're doing consulting work primarily uh, with Elixir as our specialty. So we use Elixir, Phoenix, LiveView um, for a lot of our front-end stuff. Um, my boss and I have flown about 18 hours across the world to see you all, so we're stoked to be here. Uh, I just want to apologize for my voice in advance. I'm a bit croaky after the flight, so just keep that in mind. Um, so, a bit of background uh, about how I came to work at Alembic. So, six months ago now, six, seven months ago, I got a brand new job working with Elixir, so yay! Um, I knew a little bit of Elixir, uh, but just the basics, which was quite terrifying, uh, because I had to upskill in a month to be able to consult with the Elixir ecosystem stack that we use. Um, we build full stack applications for our clients in this stack, so I needed to learn as much as possible as quickly as possible. Um, and I'm sure, as a lot of you know, onboarding juniors is never easy when it's a new language. Uh, but personally, my background was in Ruby and Ruby on Rails from the boot camp that I had graduated from, so I had to unlearn a lot of object-oriented programming knowledge that I'd gained previously and dive into functional programming, which is a very different paradigm. So we came up with two initial goals for the onboarding. Um, the first was to create a clone of Wordle using Elixir, Phoenix Live View, and Tailwind CSS, because that's what we build our client frontends with. Um, the second was to build this full stack application using test-driven development methodology um, as like a design tool, so learning to properly build bits of functionality, uh, test them thoroughly, and integrate them bit by bit. Um, this was something that we try to do with all our juniors to make them sort of learn these habits early on and do better in their careers moving forward. Um, now, we sort of have this three-tier architecture that we talk about at Alembic. Um, we have the UI and presentation at the top, application and business logic in the middle, so all of your sort of interactivity, and then a data layer sort of sitting on the bottom. Something that um, was sort of interesting about coming in as a graduate of my boot camp, which is called Coder Academy in Australia, is that um, with all of the grads we've hired from this boot camp, a lot of them have struggled with separating these concerns out into these three tiers because we, um, A, are building things really, really rapidly in a fast-paced environment because it's a boot camp, and B, we're not building for clients, we're just building something to be assessed, and that just means building something that works most of the time. Uh, so these are really important principles that we need to learn coming into the industry for the first time to be able to make robust client work. Um, so a little bit of background on Wordle, because inevitably every time I do this talk, there is one person in the room that doesn't know what Wordle is. Uh, it's a browser-based game created by a man named Josh Wardle. Uh, it got bought by the New York Times a couple of months ago. It was kind of all the rage in October of last year. Um, basically, the user tries to guess the five-letter word in six tries or less. The word is set daily, it's a secret word, and each day people can come back and play again. Um, and the colored feedback helps narrow down the possible answers as you're playing. So you've got these gray squares, that means that you know the letter is not in the word. Yellow letters mean that the letter is in the word, but not in the correct slot in that five letter uh, sort of layout. And a green letter means you've gotten it right. So it's in that slot, it's in the word. So coming in as a junior, fresh, uh, had never really built anything full stack on my own outside of bootcamp, 
This is a very large oversimplification, but this is how I thought the app should work in terms of data flow. You don't have to read all this, I just wanted to sort of point out how simple I thought it would be um, coming into this fresh. So very basic loop, you type in an answer, or a guess rather, um, it checks if the word is five letters long to make sure that it's a valid guess, checks that it's a real word in the dictionary, um, checks if it matches the day's word. If it does, you've won. If it doesn't, you get another turn unless you've used up all your turns. So that seems pretty simple. Um, you know, I kind of did identify some areas for error handling straight away, but others weren't clear until we actually began coding and using this thing, which you'll see. Um, so phase one for us was building the logic initially. So with this separation of concerns and the focus on um, separating out these layers, we wanted to build the logic first and foremost without any implementation of UI so that we could keep those two layers separate and not intermingle them. Um, using test-driven development was a really valuable learning experience while onboarding um, because it let me handle the smallest test cases first and work my way up to more complex ones and it sort of let me um, scale the work as my understanding of the testing framework uh, grew. Um, and because we focused on the separation of concerns early on with this onboarding, um, you know, I got to build like a command line interface to sort of make sure this played like a game, but I had that completely separate, and that meant that later on, when I moved to use a Phoenix Live View front end, it was really, really easy to swap out. And we've actually just used all of the um, logic that I've got uh, for the Wordle game here uh, in a completely separate app. It took us like half an hour to pull it over because it wasn't spaghetti, basically. It was nice and encapsulated. So after a couple of weeks of fiddling, um, this is sort of what we had for the command line interface version. It's not as pretty as your web-based Wordle. Um, we're kind of using some little square emojis here to replicate the uh, feedback that you would see in the UI of the actual game. Um, and I've got a GIF because every time I try and play this in a live talk, uh, it's really slow because your brain has to do the extra cognitive load. So, you know, show me the importance of a good UI implementation as well. Um, it's notably harder to play this way. So at this point, once we had this uh, sort of command line interface version, we'd finished almost everything we needed for the back end to work with a front end in the browser. And then a big hairy bug popped up. Um, and if you're a fan of the YouTube channel 3 Blue One Brown, I think it is, uh, he also came across this issue in his optimization for Wordle algorithm. We were using this method on the screen to check each of our letters in a guess. Um, it seems pretty straightforward. You take in your guess letter, your secret letter from the word, um, all of the secret letters from the secret word, and you're just checking to see if the guess letter is equal to the secret letter in that position. If it is, it's marked as correct. Um, otherwise, if it's in the secret letters array, um, but it's not in the correct spot, so it's not marked as correct, it's marked as a partially correct letter, and otherwise it's marked as incorrect, it's not in the word at all, which, you know, seems simple enough. Um, so when you're playing Wordle, uh, you expect that when the player guesses a word with two of the same letter, but the secret word only includes one of that letter, we expect the resulting highlighting um, in the UI to show one of the letters as either a match or a partial match, and the other to be grayed out as incorrect. So you can see here in the word speed, with two E's, they've guessed the word speed, abide has one E, it should be only showing one E as a partial match. Likewise, with the word crepe, um, it should be showing one correct match, so that E is in the right place. Uh, the second E is in the wrong place, but it is in the word, so it should be marked as yellow. And with speed in the third case, arrays being the secret word, uh, the S is partial, they've guessed two E's in speed, and they're both in the wrong slot, but they are both in the word, so they should both be marked as yellow. Um, that's what the real Wordle does, that's what the web version does, and that's what we expected our app to do. In reality, the algorithm that we'd written wasn't accounting for duplicate letters. It was just not something that we'd kept in mind. Um, the, the app was spitting out, if we had speed as our guess and abide as the secret word, it would mark both of the E's as partially correct. And you might be able to see how this would make the game practically unplayable if you got into this particular situation. Um, we didn't see this happening initially. We were playing the game just for fun and we had this situation occur and realized that something had gone horribly wrong. 
Um, likewise, in the word speed as your guess and steel as your secret word, there's one E. Um, and for some reason, because it was looping over multiple E's, it was marking them both as partial, even though one was correct. And then with the word speed and arrays, it was marking them both as partially correct, which is technically the correct answer, or the feedback that you would expect. Um, but it was mapping both E's to the first instance of E in that word, and not taking into account the latter E. So we had to rewrite the entire letter guess algorithm. Um, so we sort of came up with this way. We set an initial state where each of our secret letters is initially set to incorrect, r regardless of what the guess is and how it compares to the secret word. This is just a default state. And then once the initial state is set, we pass the state to a simple sort of guess function, which pipes the player's guess through two different passes. Um, it'll do one to check for exact matches first, so letters in the correct slot, and one to check for partial matches second, so letters that are in the word but not in their correct position. So we've got a correct pass function here. It's a little bit chunky, but the basis of it is it converts our secret word, uh, so the word that they're trying to guess, into a char list, does the same thing to the player's guess word. It zips each of those words, uh, those char lists together so the letters are paired up in their positions directly equivalent to one another. Um, and then, you know, they're already set to incorrect uh, as their sort of default state. And it reduces over this resulting zipped list and runs a compare letter function, which I'll show you in a moment, um, to sort of compare each of them in their direct equivalent slots. Um, and at the end, it reverses it because as you're working through a list, you know, it, it gets out in the wrong order. Um, so this is our compare letter function, as I mentioned. Um, it's just comparing letters one to one with a bit of pattern matching where the letter is the same. So letter is equal to letter and marks it as correct. It's in the correct slot. It's there. Um, otherwise, uh, it's marked as incorrect because we haven't done our partial pass yet. Uh, we also have this sort of pool of remaining letters that are yet to be guessed, which lets us account for multiples of the same letter. Partial pass does much the same thing. Um, it does those two enum conversions to char lists, uh, zips them together, one-to-one -one equivalencies, and reduces over it um, and checks if the letter guessed is in the pool of remaining letters. Uh, so like I said, it can account for duplicates. If it is in the pool of remaining letters, we get a partial match. If not, it is marked as incorrect and remains that way. Um, and then, yeah, so you've just got some very, very basic uh, pattern matching going on, which was a really, really interesting use case as a junior, because pattern matching is something I had to get my head around. This is what nailed it for me, um, you know, that one-to-one -one direct matching. Um, and then we ended up building the front end. So, like I mentioned, because we had this highly modularized logic, uh, we were really, really easily able to pull out the command line interface module that we built and stick the logic that we had directly into a Phoenix app and build a front end with LiveView. Um, and LiveView's event handling made it really, really quick and easy to implement key presses, which I'll show you in the demo, um, to be able to type physically on your keyboard rather than just having the virtual keyboard on the screen. So it's perfect for accessibility. Um, and Tailwind is what we primarily use at Alembic on our front ends for styling. It lets us style things really, really rapidly. I think I styled this in about an hour total. So um, let's play Weirdle, which is definitely not Wordle. Would anyone like to throw out a first guess? Go. Cares. Cares. Ooh, okay, we've got a partial match on C and a complete match on A. Can I get a second guess? I should have brought thinking music for the background here. Match. match. Very nice, we've got a partial match on T and C. Very nice. We've got a match on A and C now. T -A -C -K -Y. Tacky, I like it. Very nice, very nice. T A C is a match. Tacit, I like it. 
Very nice. So that is ultimately uh, what we ended up building after a month at Alembic through onboarding. Um, so yeah. I've got a couple of key takeaways that I sort of want to discuss here that I think are really important for anyone training up a new junior, whether it be um, you know coming directly out of uh, their their sort of like degree or boot camp or whatever they studied at, or um, you know that they're, they're just learning Elixir for the first time, even if they have previous development experience. And I think the first key takeaway for me is that onboarding is the perfect chance to establish good habits early on. Um, so, you know, learning typical design patterns and why they are the typical design patterns for Elixir are um, really important. And things like best practices, you know, test-driven development as a design tool or whatever sort of tools uh, your company uses, this is the perfect chance to sort of ingrain that into Junior's onboarding and build those habits early so that they're better coders later on. Key takeaway number two is to build something from scratch directly and you know that helps them see the whole picture. Um, I found for me building a full stack app from scratch is closer to a realistic day-to-day -day project um, at Alembic than doing something like tutorials or workbooks where you kind of have this really rigid guided experience that doesn't necessarily reflect day-to-day -day consulting. Um, Building Wordle from scratch in our tech stack that we actually use with our clients meant that I had to work through like the processes of setting up my environment, learning how to do TDD, um, debugging issues as they arose, working with teammates. Um, I was very lucky to have a lot of support through this, but that process uh, is largely day-to-day -day work at Alembic, and I think it set me up really well to be a better consultant early on. I would say it's also really, really beneficial to have a tangible goal to keep focus on building core skills. And what I mean by that is when we set out to build Wordle, we had a real physical thing that we could directly compare our build to, and it had you know, behaviors that we expected to be able to replicate correctly in our app. It had, you know, the UI was sort of already there, we knew what we were building, and that meant that we had more time to focus on actually gaining valuable knowledge and building our practical skills in Elixir and problem solving skills without wasting time worrying about, oh my God, what am I going to build? Is it going to be the right project for onboarding? Is it going to be enough of a learning experience? We pushed all that aside, we went for it. And because we had that tangible end goal in sight, we were able to really, really quickly get in, start working and you know work towards something concrete rather than flailing about. And finally, I think having expected behaviors to replicate makes for an easier time debugging, as we saw with that weird letter matching algorithm. Um, you know, having something there that is an expected behavior that you know you are supposed to be replicating means that you know exactly when there begins to be an issue because you can see it straight away. It's not doing exactly what you thought it would be doing. And this ties in with my last point about having sort of an end goal in mind having that sort of physical thing there to directly compare one to one makes it easier to debug when things are going wrong because you know for a fact they're going wrong. And I think as a junior, um, it can be really, really tempting to sort of go, oh, it's good enough, it's fine, it sort of works. Um, but this really pushed us to do better. Um, and it also ties in with using test-driven development as a design tool because you do have those sort of expected behaviors from your tests when they don't work out, you've still got red tests, you need to come back and keep iterating on that code until it passes. And that was a super, super valuable learning experience for me. Um, so yeah, all up, that's sort of the gist of it. Uh, we built an entire project in a month for onboarding at Alembic. You can see more of what we do at the website there. Please feel free to come and nag me on Twitter if you wanna chat about anything. Um, and yeah, thank you.